Karen Matthews. That's the name I'll try to forget for the rest of my life. I'm Roger Turner, and I've been married to Karen for 20 years. Like most ignorant husbands, I thought we had a good marriage until I discovered the opposite. Karen and I were two working-class children from a municipal area. We went to the same school, although we had different groups of friends. We knew each other, but we didn't start dating until a few years after we graduated from high school. At that time, Karen was working as a lawyer's secretary, and I had just started my own business. My business was websites, in particular, design and hosting. Two comparison sites that I developed made a lot of profit, one for insurance, the other for checking prices. When Karen and I got married, I was already worth a lot of money, and to protect my business, my lawyer offered to sign a prenuptial agreement. It said that if the marriage broke up for any reason, Karen would receive a percentage of my personal fortune, and thinking that we would be together for life, I gladly signed it. Karen signed it knowing that no matter what happened, she would be rich. Although our careers were different, we were good at one thing in bed. Our eldest son was born 19 months after the wedding, and four years later the twins were born. Now I was the father of three boys. The only thing we disagreed on were the names, and for some reason Karen wanted to use names with a biblical background. Since we weren't religious, I didn't see the point. We agreed on the name Robert for the eldest child, and four years later, the twins were named Ethan and Luke. Even though we both worked, we always found time on weekends to spend them together as a family. We had a nice family home in a nice neighborhood. Most of our neighbors were businessmen and a few minor celebrities. We were constantly invited to parties or business events, but we often declined the invitation to spend time with the children. My business had grown to the point where I now had 40 employees. Don Healy was my executive director and second in command. The rest of the staff were either technical specialists or financial workers. As any employer knows, good employees are hard to find these days and even harder to keep. For this reason, I have always been looking for incentives to retain my employees. Every year on their birthday, I gave them a day off with paycheck, plus I paid for lunch for an employee and his spouse or partner. I decided to offer all employees a package of private medical care, the advantage of which was that they could receive urgent treatment rather than queue up at the NHS, National Health Service of England, trans. Since the package included next of kin, most of the staff appreciated the gesture. As part of the medical package, there was a health check every two years. I was a month away from my 45th birthday when I received an invitation for a medical examination. Thinking that I would set a good example for my employees, I agreed. The doctor asked me a few questions about my lifestyle. Did I smoke? Have I been drinking? The usual questions that one would expect. He carried out all the usual checks, such as measuring height, weight, and blood pressure. To complete the tests, I was asked to take a blood and urine test. The doctor explained that they would conduct tests, and if there were any problems, they would contact me. I went back to work knowing that I looked healthy and fit. In the evening, Karen and I talked about Robert's upcoming 18th birthday. We decided to throw a party for him, and after some thought, we stopped at the venue. We both said we didn't want drunk 18-year-olds walking around our house. Two days before the party, I received the news that turned my life around. The doctor wanted to talk to me about the results of my tests. Is that bad news, doc? I asked, sitting down where the doctor pointed. It's not life-threatening, Mr. Turner. The problem is that you seem to have hemochromatosis. Since you lead a relatively healthy lifestyle, you don't have any obvious symptoms. With the help of some medications, we can help control the disease. Any idea how I got infected? I asked. I'm afraid it's a hereditary condition, Mr. Turner. The symptoms differ in each known case. Some men suffer from chronic internal pain, others live without pain, but are infertile. You belong to the latter group. Heredity. I'd better check on my sons. Doc, did you just say that I'm infertile? Yes, Mr. Turner. The test results show that you are sterile, and based on our experience, I would say that you have always been sterile. I could tell by the look on his face what he was thinking. The doctor told me about the medications he prescribed. Fortunately, he gave me some pamphlets to read, but I was still shocked, so I didn't hear much of what he was saying to me. I planned to return to the office before the end of the day, but instead went home. While Karen was at work and the boys were at school, I had time to think. Having stopped feeling sorry for myself, I enrolled the boys for urgent testing. 
If these aren't my sons, I wanted answers from my wife. During dinner that night, I explained what I had learned today, and the boys didn't mind taking the test. Karen was not so enthusiastic, and given that the boys' health was the main concern, I could not understand her position. Regardless of how Karen felt, two days after the party, I took the boys for testing. It has been an agonizing few days waiting for the results. When I got the results, my emotions were mixed. Please sit down, Mr. Turner. The doctor pointed to a chair. What's wrong with me? I asked, knowing that everything was clear with the boys. It seemed strange to us that after extensive tests, none of your sons showed any signs of hemochromatosis. Since we still had your samples, I asked the lab to do a DNA test. I hope you don't mind I saw your concern at our last meeting. I looked at the doctor, knowing it would be bad news. I'm afraid the tests have shown that you are not the biological father of your sons. I jumped up, claiming that the test results were incorrect. The doctor allowed me to rant for a few minutes before I calmed down and sat down again. Do all boys have the same father? I asked. Yes. The test confirmed that the father of all three boys was the same man. Since you didn't know about your condition, I assume your wife didn't know either? My wife didn't know. She still doesn't know the whole story. I told her about my health problems, but I didn't mention that I was infertile. I clung to the hope that the boys would be mine. I'm sorry, Mr. Turner. I nodded my head. Could you give me a printed copy of the DNA results? I have a feeling I'm going to need them very soon. I thanked the doctor and left. Normally, I could have thought about going home, but today I decided to go back to the office. As soon as I entered the office, Don realized that something was wrong. He followed me into my office and closed the door. What's wrong, Roger? You look like death. I have bad news, Don. I sat down and explained everything to Don. Jesus Christ, Roger. What are you going to do about it? Don asked. As I see it, I have two options. I can say nothing and keep playing dumb, ignorant husband, or I can stand up to Karen. The latter will probably lead to a divorce, I replied. 20 years. I've been living a lie for 20 damn years. All this time I thought the boys were mine. Calm down, Roger. I'm sure there's an explanation for this. Oh, I'm sure there is, Don. Maybe Karen will explain it to me tonight. I'll leave you in charge for a few days. I need to sort out this mess. I'm sorry, Roger. Take as much as you need. I'll contact you if there's anything I can't handle. Don returned to his office, and I sat and thought about how to sort out this mess. I mentally estimated that Karen would receive about two million pounds if we divorced. Considering that I was worth ten times more, I could afford it. I called my lawyer to consult. Since he mainly worked with corporate clients, he recommended Arthur Crenshaw. Arthur Crenshaw was an old-school lawyer. He knew a lot about the legal system. I told him about the prenuptial agreement we had made. Are you sure this is what you want to do, Mr. Turner? Yes. My wife won't be able to tell me anything to fix the situation. Can I pick up the papers when they are ready? Of course. I'm in court tomorrow, and my secretary, Marion, will bring them to you. I thanked Arthur and left. I drove around the neighborhood until it was time to go home. When I entered the house, the twins were watching TV, and Karen was cooking dinner. Where's Robert? I asked. Stayed with friends for the night. The four of us are having dinner tonight, Karen smiled. I was wondering if she would smile later, after our little chat. After dinner, the twins went to their rooms. After loading the dishwasher, I joined Karen in the living room. I had an interesting conversation with the doctor. Really? About what? Karen replied calmly. It was about the fact that the boys have no signs of a hereditary disease, which I have. After doing all the tests, they found nothing, which is apparently very unusual. They solved the mystery when the doctor did a DNA test. The boy's DNA doesn't match mine, and I thought, could you explain? Karen sat in silence and looked at me for a minute. I have nothing to say. The boys are not yours. I fell in love with another man shortly after our wedding. My love was so strong that I wanted his children. When you and I were trying to have a baby, I used a diaphragm until I made love to him, Karen replied, almost without emotion. If you fell in love with someone else, why didn't you divorce me and play happy family with him? Because he was already married and had children. Now that we know that you are infertile, it seems that I made the right decision. If not for that, we would never have become parents. I don't believe I'm hearing this. You got pregnant by another man because you fell in love with him. 
This means that we have been living a lie for 20 years. I still love you, Roger. It's just that I loved another person more. I see. Otherwise, you wouldn't have given birth to his children. I'm going away for a while. I can't be around you right now. Today, I will sleep in the spare room. I rushed out of the house and ran away. After a few drinks in the pub, I returned home. Karen was sitting and watching TV. I ignored her and went to the spare room. I pretended to be asleep when, about 30 minutes later, she knocked on the door. In the morning, I took a shower, got dressed, and left the house without saying a word. After a while, Karen sent me a message. Are you okay? What do you think? I replied. Karen didn't answer. I met with Dawn, then spent the morning looking for a house to buy. Later that day, I picked up the divorce papers. When I drove up to the house, Karen was alone. She smiled when I entered the house. Where are the boys? I asked sharply. Robert is walking again, and the twins are with my parents. Since we need to talk, I thought it would be better if the boys weren't here. I'm glad you assumed I'd be coming home. Really, I don't quite understand what you think we should talk about. I'm going to go up the stairs and change, and while I'm doing that, you can take a look at this. I threw the envelope on the kitchen table and left. Karen was standing with her arms folded and a defiant expression on her face when I returned to the kitchen. Really, Roger? A divorce? Yes, Karen. The divorce? You told me last night that you love another man more than you love me. You loved him so much that you even gave birth to his fucking children. But I still love you, Roger. Yes, of course, but not enough to have my children. The fact that I am infertile does not change anything. If we had known then, we could have adopted. You left and got pregnant by that bastard, leaving me no say. As far as I know, you're still making love to him. Divorce is the only way out for me, Karen. As you can see, I was fair. You will receive two million pounds, according to the prenuptial agreement. When I mentioned that Karen was still making love to him, she looked at the floor, and that told me everything I wanted to know. This is my house, Karen, so you have to move out. Find a place and I'll pay for it. We'll deduct it from your sum of two million pounds. In the meantime, I'll stay at the hotel. What about alimony? Karen practically screamed. Since Robert is over 18, it doesn't matter. If you need alimony for the twins, ask their father, whoever he is. You're making a big mistake, Roger. You are listed as the boy's father, so you have to pay for them. I made a mistake when I married you, Karen. Just out of interest, who is the boy's father? I won't tell you. It won't change anything anyway. You're going to get a divorce anyway. Then I went back upstairs to pack my clothes. I was going to stay at the hotel for a few nights until I sorted something out. Karen was sitting at the table, crying as I carried the suitcases downstairs. I'll be back for my stuff in a day or two. I've got enough for a few days, I said, not waiting for an answer. I found an apartment that I could rent for two months, hoping that's all I'd need it for. It also gave Karen a chance to find a place to live. Karen called me several times asking me to change my mind, but after the last call, which was very stressful, she gave up. My lawyer said she signed and returned the divorce papers. I gave her a month to vacate the house. Robert called to tell me that he was unhappy with his mother. He asked if he could move in with me when I found a place. I told Robert that in this case, on the contrary, his mother would move out of the house. When I called to talk to Ethan and Luke, they told me they didn't want to talk to me. I heard Luke shouting that he hated me. One evening, Robert and I were talking when Karen called him. He turned on the speakerphone. Yes, what do you need? Robert said sharply. Robert, don't talk to me like that. I'm your mother. Show me some respect. Respect? This is ridiculous. Robert stopped and stared at the phone. You brought this on yourself. You destroyed this family. I don't want to have anything to do with you or the donor you call my father. Stay away from me and don't call me anymore. You are nothing more than an evil witch. Robert pressed the button to end the call. You should try to maintain some kind of relationship with your mother, I advised. She can go to hell, dad. I don't want anything to do with her. Hopefully, the twins will realize what an evil person she is and leave when they are old enough. Karen found a home for herself and the twins. She left a room for Robert, not that he was going to use it. I was there the day she moved out. Take the bed, Karen. I'll buy a new one. We've never done anything in the house. I don't believe a word you're saying, so take the bed. The twins ignored me the whole time we were in the house. 
they didn't look back when Karen left. Thanks to my wealth and the status of an ordinary child who achieved good results, the newspapers followed the story of the divorce. Public opinion was on my side. Most people thought that Karen had treated me badly. Five months later, the divorce was final. Unfortunately, I had to pay alimony for the twins. Roger, this is Arthur. I'm just calling to let you know that you are a single man. The divorce became final today. Thank you, Arthur. I have a few questions for you. Can I challenge the alimony claim, and can I get my name removed from the boys' birth certificates? You can appeal the alimony claim, although it may take some time. The real father will have to take a paternity test before anything happens. He will probably try to avoid the test at all costs. There is another way. It will cost a little more, but the result will be achieved faster. And what is the alternative? I asked. You can sue your ex-wife for parental fraud. This will mean that you will be deleted from your birth certificates, and you will be able to claim back all the alimony that you paid after the divorce. If I subpoena her, I will ask her to name her father. She will not be able to refuse to answer if she is under oath. This way, you can sue him for overdue alimony. Come on, Arthur. Prepare the papers and submit them, please. I'll do it, Roger. I'll let you know when Karen gets them. Three days later, I was informed that Karen had been handed documents on parental rights fraud. I was expecting a call from Karen. Her silence bothered me a little. Arthur called me and said Karen's lawyer wanted to set up an appointment. I told him to tell them I wasn't interested and we'd see each other in court. On the day of the hearing, I sat with Arthur. Karen sat with her lawyer. She had a worried expression on her face. I assumed that her lawyer was someone from the law firm where she works. The hearing began with me explaining why I was suing Karen. Karen's lawyer asked me questions, as well as Arthur. After lunch, Karen ran into the lawyers. Her lawyer was softer with her. Arthur wasn't so condescending. Ms. Matthews, your ex-husband is suing you for parental rights fraud. At a recent divorce hearing, you admitted that my client is not the father of your three sons. My client wants his name removed from the birth certificates and replaced with the name of his biological father. Could you tell us who the real father is? Karen sat in silence, staring at the floor. I can't. It will destroy his family and ruin his life, Karen replied. Just like you ruined mine, I thought to myself. The judge's voice brought me back to reality. Miss Matthews, may I remind you that you are under oath? Please answer the question. Karen sat and stared straight ahead. She answered in a low voice, almost a whisper. Speak up, Miss Matthews, the judge said to Karen. Lawrence Rosenthal, Karen replied, and then stared at the floor again. A young woman stood behind me and left the court, and Arthur turned to the judge. Your Honor, Ms. Matthews gave the name of the biological father of her children. All my client wants is to remove his name from the birth certificates. Arthur came back and sat down next to me. The judge looked down at some papers. I decided that Miss Matthews deceived her ex-husband into believing that he was the father of three children, although this is clearly not the case. Miss Matthews, I sentence you to six months in prison, suspended for two years. If you appear in court for any offense, these six months will be added to any sentence imposed, do you understand? Karen replied in the affirmative. Turning to me, the judge said, Mr. Turner, by court order, your name will be removed from the birth certificates of Miss Matthews' children. Since it has been proven that you are not the father, I release you from any financial obligations regarding alimony. Thank you, Your Honor, I replied. We stood while the judge left the courtroom. Arthur gathered up his papers, and we left the court. Karen came up to us in the foyer. I hope you're satisfied, Roger. You've probably ruined a man's life, not to mention ruined his marriage. With your money, you could afford to pay child support for a few more years. If you'll excuse me, I need to talk to Larry and tell him what happened. I hope I never see you or talk to you again, Roger. Arthur spoke up. Miss Matthews, I do not know what you are going to say to Mr. Rosenthal. I think it's fair to warn you that 10 minutes ago, he was handed alimony documents. Good day. Arthur and I left, leaving Karen crying. How did you manage to serve Rosenthal so quickly? I asked Arthur. Marion prepared the documents. We only needed his name. When Karen told me who it was, my assistant came out of court to call Marion. She printed out the papers and handed them to the waiting bailiff. Mr. Rosenthal was notified before the end of the hearing. Arthur smiled. The attorney told me that Rosenthal fainted when he opened the envelope. 
He was taken away in an ambulance when Karen entered the office. As with my divorce, all the newspapers were in business. Larry Rosenthal became a celebrity when newspapers appeared in stores the next day. It was through the media that I found out what happened. When the senior partners found out what caused Rosenthal's collapse, they compounded his troubles and fired him. His relationship with Karen was contrary to company policy. Karen was also fired. My case against Rosenthal was left to chance. His wife cleared it in the course of a messy divorce. The court recorded in his personal file that he owed me 450,000 pounds, but I did not expect to see a cent of it. Money wasn't a problem for me. I just wanted to ruin his life like he ruined mine. True to her word, Karen hasn't spoken to me since that day in court. Larry moved in with Karen when his wife kicked him out, and as far as I know, they're still together. Robert lives with me. He still refuses to acknowledge his mother and biological father. Now I divide my time between business and friends. I have several girlfriends with benefits, but none of them are serious, as I have no intention of getting married again. Twenty years of living a lie was more than enough for me.